Oh, wait, you're listening. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. <clears throat> you're listening, listening to Radio Lab. Radio Lab. From WNYC. See? See? Yeah. Hey, I'm Jad Abumrad. And I'm Robert Krilwich. Yep, this is Radio Lab. And uh, today, just to start things off for this podcast, all right, let's just say that you love an author, but somehow the text isn't enough. Okay. It doesn't get you close enough to the author. So what do you do? You know what you do? What? Take off your shoes. You take off your stocks. <laughs> and you stand and on you the book. And you stand on the book. <laughs> and your whole body says, let me in. Let me in. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me give you a different flavor of that. Hello. How about you take the text, give it to this guy, he puts it into a computer, and you turn it into... Data. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Who, who is that? Uh, this is a... Uh, My name is Ian Lancashire. I'm a professor of English at the University of Toronto. Now, Ian, as he said, is an English professor, but he's also a computer guy. Right. Founded a computing center with the help of IBM Canada. And, uh, and the reason he combines our, those two is because he's interested in the secrets behind the author's words. Mm. And that desire, he says, to take a text, spin it into data as a way to get into that author's head, well, that goes back a long way. It goes back to the fathers of the Christian church. To the Bible. In the early Middle Ages. Some monks decided to make what's called a concordance of the Bible. And what that means is they were going to take every single word in the Bible, and there are 960,243 of them, at least in the King James Version. And they were going to list them all alphabetically, notate each time every single word was used, and the context. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, imagine it. You begin with the first verse. In the beginning. <laughs> you create a heading for the first word. In. All and right. then for the second word. The. And then for the third. Beginning. Every time you come across those words, you have to write a context. In Genesis 1, verse 1, occurrence 1, in the beginning. Genesis 1, verse 6, occurrence 2, and God said, let there be firmament in the midst. It's all handwritten, and at the end you end, well, you end up with uh, a lot of pieces of paper. So many that it, it took those first monks, you know, who decided to do this, an entire lifetime to complete it. Nowadays, you know, with computers, you can be done in... In under... 15 seconds. Bam! So that all just basically sets the stage for the story that I'm about to tell you. It's the 1980s. Ian is an English professor at Toronto. He's got a lab full of computers, and he's using them to analyze his favorite authors. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, T.S. Eliot, James Joyce, Cadman, Chaucer, Shakespeare. And he's starting up some interesting stuff, sort of. For example, in his poetry, Milton didn't use the word because. Who knows why? Yeah. But at a certain point, Ian decided to look at more modern authors. And so I turned to Agatha Christie. At the time he was doing this, we're now in the 90s, Agatha Christie happened to be the most published author ever. She sold a billion books. A billion? Like B-billion? She was number one. Behind God. Uh, after, after the Bible, I think. <laughs> so what I did is I collected two of her earliest novels, written in the early 20s. He fed those two into the computer. Then I did the third. Eventually, he would add in 14 additional books that cover 50 years of Agatha Christie's writing. But what is the computer doing exactly? It's measuring the individual concordance, word frequency, the vocabulary of the works. And all the while, it's spitting out these reports. <clears throat> and I saw the totals at the bottom. So all this now, first of all, the woman wrote 80 minute. detective novels, which is just amazing in and of itself. The computer like found that her use of language was relatively consistent and normal uh, for the first 72 of those books. But something happened on book number 73, something drastic. What? Suddenly, her use of words like... Words like thing, anything, something, nothing. What Ian calls indefinite words. These... These words increased six times. But also, when the computer added up the vocabulary size of that book... That is, how many different words are there in the first 50,000 words of a text? It found in this book, there were 20% fewer different words. That is astounding. That's one-fifth of our vocabulary lost. It gradually dawned on him that what he might be seeing was the very beginning stages of an author 
losing herself. She had developed Alzheimer's. I delayed publishing my results for two years. I, I had to, to have the results analyzed by computational linguist and a um, statistician. And in her lifetime, was she ever actually diagnosed? Absolutely not. There was no diagnosis. He said that some of her biographers suspected that something was up in her later years. At one point, apparently, she cut off all of her hair. She was not doing very well in interviews. But as far as we know, she was never taken to a doctor, never got diagnosed. I think her family closed around her and protected her. I realized that I was seeing something about the human mind. I was seeing the author in the text in a way that people hadn't seen the author in the text before. Which raised a question for me, and I think this can apply to anyone. I mean, we all write a bazillion emails a day. I've got a decade's worth on my computer. Does that stuff hold clues about what will be? Like early warning signs? I think it's possible it does, yes. And it's well worth doing research about how a loss of vocabulary can be determined, let's say, in one's email over five or six years. Indications are, he says, that those clues are there. Not only that, they may actually be there practically from the beginning. Oh. Yep. yep. Very famous example is the so-called Nun study. Okay, the, the Nun study actually began in 1990. And what's this is Dr. Kelvin Dr. Lim. He works at the University of Minnesota and is the current director of the so-called Nun study. And this study, more than any other that we know, really makes the point about the predictive power of the words we choose. The study began with a guy named David Snowden who wanted to uh, look at aging over time. So he chose nuns because he wanted a group that was healthy. For example, they don't smoke, they don't drink. They all have similar lifestyles. They obviously haven't had children. So he approached this one particular order in Connecticut. Called the School Sisters of Notre Dame. And he signed up just short of 700 nuns. And the only stipulation being... You had to be at least 75 years of age. And so we're now 20 years into the study, so that means the youngest of the sisters is about 95. Yeah, I think I am, I am the youngest. And you are 94 years old. Yes, sir. Not 95. Not 95. <laughs> <laughs> this is Sister Alberta Sheridan. I like the way you said that. Do you happen to know who the oldest remaining sister in the study is? Wait a minute. No, the one who was buried today, Jad, was 101. I think she was the oldest one in the study. Wow. In our province, yes. The study began, uh, innocently enough, she says, uh, researchers would show up to the convent every year, give the nuns a bunch of tests. Uh, but like, mostly from memory. You're just questioning back and forth. And then over the years, as the nuns passed away, which many of them have at this point... They've all gone, Jed. ...of the original 678 sisters? At this point, we have approximately 40 sisters still alive and participating in the study. And I'm the only one left here in the Wilton province. And as the nuns would pass away, the researchers had arranged it so that they would get a small piece of their brains. Yes. Which they could examine for plaques and tangles. Now, this morning, we buried a sister here, I told you. But the funeral was delayed a bit because she had to be taken to the hospital to have a portion of her brain removed to further the study. Oh. Mm-hmm. Hello, this is David from Berlin. Radio Lab is supported in part by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation in enhancing public understanding of science and technology in the modern world. More information about Sloan at www.sloan.org. Science reporting on Radio Lab is supported in part by Science Sandbox, a Simons Foundation initiative dedicated to engaging everyone with the process of science. Okay, so here's why I bring this study up. Because of an accident that happened pretty early on that changed everything in the study. David Snowden, the main dude, was in the uh, convent archives and he was talking to the archivist. The archivist says to him, hey, you know all of these nuns that you're studying who right now are over the age of 75? I actually have the essays that they wrote right when they got here. And they did this roughly at about age 18. Like 60 years before? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Right. I have a copy of it at home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Come on in, Naomi. Thank you so much. We actually asked a reporter, Naomi Sterabin, to visit Sister Alberta at her home so in Connecticut. Are you late? 
today. And have her read her essay that is now 76 years old. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> Two days after the birth of the Christ child, I was brought as a belated Christmas gift to a Mr. and Mrs. Albert Joseph Sheridan of Providence, Rhode Island. A week later, the sparkling waters of baptism were poured over me. I'm not going to read all the silly stuff that when I first entered. Why not? It sounds kind of saccharine. I was only a teenager when I wrote. But here's the thing. When the researchers found the essays like the one you just heard, it was a gold mine. There was a major, major find. So they analyzed the essays looking primarily at two specific features of the language that was contained in these narratives. That's Sergei Pahoma. He does the analysis for the current non-study. In particular, they looked at the notion of grammatical complexity and uh, idea density. What is idea density? What does that mean? Idea density is um, a, a measure that looks at how many basic units of meaning are contained in any given utterance divided by the total number of words in that utterance. In other words... The date of my birth is December 27th. Uh, like if you were to listen to Sister Alberta's autobiography. When I was 11 years of age, my dear mother was called to God. It's the number of little discrete ideas she's able to cram us. into one sentence. This was to be a turning point in my life as I had always had the ardent desire to become a sister. Here's a classic example of the difference between low and high idea density. Here's low. From Sister Helen, I was born in Eau Claire, Wisconsin on May 24th, 1913, and was baptized in St. James Church. Okay, that's low. Now here's high. From Sister Emma, it was about a half hour before midnight between February 28th and 29th of the leap year 1912 when I began to live and to die as the third child of my mother, whose maiden name is Hilda Hoffman and my father, Otto Schmidt. I got to say, I'm liking the first one. <laughs> Jed, probably you, know? you as a journalist see the first one as straight to the point. Yeah, it's good writing. And the second one seems kind of embellished. A little bit, yeah. But here's the punchline of all this. It turns out that the people who, when they were 18 wrote in that journalistically very precise, low idea density sort of way, those people, 60 years later, were vastly, vastly more likely to develop dementia. In fact, based on those essays alone, the researchers could predict, with about 85% accuracy, what the nuns' brains would look like when they died and were able to look at the brains. I mean, would the brains have plaques and tangles that you associate with Alzheimer's, or would they not? What? I mean, that's just crazy. Wait, why? It's backwards reasoning. Well, we'll see. We'll Wait. see. I'm, I'm, I'm just suddenly, I'm suspicious. Here's why? a man who, from what you just said, has found the ones who got sick and working backwards, found certain incidences of this, that, or the other, and says, ah, this is a cause that produces this effect. No, 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 no. There's no cause and effect here. These studies are, are demonstrating associations, right? They're not demonstrating causality. Right? It's a very important distinction. This is just a correlation, okay? But, you know, that may be one of 190 correlations that produce uh, people who get Alzheimer's in the end. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, but let me argue your case actually from a different angle. Like, would this kind of linguistic analysis actually be relevant in the, in the age of Twitter, where everything is short and clipped? But people who Twitter don't short... only Twitter. They might also write um, small, short, dense essays for their... Yeah, but, well, you know, I, mean, I guess you are right. It's like it's mostly about the thoughts in your head, not so much what you write. Well, so what about Agatha Christie? Was there a conclusion about Agatha? Yeah, there was. Agatha Christie writing, Elephants Can Remember. This brings us back to Ian Lancaster and uh, that 73rd book of Agatha Christie's that he analyzed and found that her vocabulary dipped. Well, before he did the analysis, he picked up that book and gave it a read. And like most people who read it, didn't like it. Initially, I thought it was very poorly written. Badly plotted, full of errors of time, of dating. Terrible read. Then I realized when I looked at the title, Elephants Can Remember. He realized that maybe Agatha Christie sensed what was happening to her. She was responding to that truism that elephants never forget. Hmm. The, uh, the chief character is an, an aging female novelist named Ariadne, who is a foil for Agatha herself. And she... Ariadne is suffering from memory loss. In the story, she tries to help a detective solve this crime. 
but she has trouble because she keeps forgetting. And uh, the last, uh, the last uh, sentence in that novel, in fact, is Agatha saying, well, maybe it's okay not to remember. Wow. She was trying to defend herself, defend her sense that she was forgetting. She was losing her vocabulary. She was losing her language. I began to see that Christie was heroic, still writing despite this handicap. Yeah. And her willingness to do that at an age of 81, 82, struck me as, uh, as heroic in a way. Well, I understand that. That's... The muse wouldn't quit, but the, the tools all left the room. Yeah. I think we should leave the room. Okay. Radio Lab was created by Jada Boomrod and is edited by Soren Wheeler. Lulu Miller and Latif Nasser are our co-hosts. Susie Lechtenberg is our executive producer. And Dylan Keefe is our director of sound design. Our staff includes Simon Adler, Jeremy Bloom, Becca Bressler, Rachel Cusick, W. Harry Fortuna, David Gable, Maria Paz Gutierrez, Sindunyana Sambandam, Matt Kilty, Annie McEwen, Alex Neeson, Sarah Kari, Ariane Wack, Pat Walters, and Molly Webster. With help from Tanya Chavla and Sarah Sonbach, our fact checkers are Diane Kelly, Emily Krieger, and Adam Chabill. Thank you.